Hello, I'm Hannah, and this is Hannah's Books. A couple of days ago, Roz at Scally Danling About the Books put together a really wonderful tag. The immediate stated purpose of the tag is to meet all of the Springathon prompts in one go. A great idea itself. Springathon is the perfectly timed readathon planned by the women behind the channel's curious reader a cup of books and blank garden that asks us to read literature about nature. Perhaps more interesting than the ability to respond to Springathon in one go, I think, is that Ross asks us to consider responding briefly or extensively to specific poems. So we'll all be in conversation to a degree about the same works. And perhaps even more interesting is that she asks us to consider adding our own choices of poems that meet the prompts. So we'll be creating a wide net of shared poetry via this tag. In her video, she also suggested that each of us might use examples from our own special places, be that the actual physical region or place where we live or the place where most of our books come from. If we're fans of ancient literature, choices from ancient literature. If we're readers of literature from a specific country, poems from there, etc. Since Ross's poems were all from the British Isles, I've called my list of new editions from the US, and I've tried to choose a few major American authors. Four of the six poems are from poets who are considered absolutely bedrock American poets from the second half of the 19th century and the early part of the 20th. The other two examples I've chosen are from more contemporary American poets, who mean a lot to me and to many other readers. When Ross talked about why she tagged me, she mentioned that she hoped I would recite or read some of the poems. I'm very flattered by her comments and a little embarrassed, but I'll try to do exactly that in this response. Okay, so the game is to read the poem for each of the prompts below, react to them as briefly or energetically as you prefer, and suggest an alternative poem inspired by that prompt if you wish. The first prompt is Bird. Roz chose the gentle poem The Thrush's Nest by John Clare, a poem I had not read before. I especially like Claire's imaging of the bird as artist, of crafter, warping the nest as if she were a weaver preparing for newly created life. For the bird prompt, I'll choose a selection from the very long Song of Myself by 19th century poet Walt Whitman. Here's a bit of it. The spotted hawk swoops by and accuses me. He complains of my gab and my loitering. I, too, am not a bit tamed. I, too, am untranslatable. I sound my barbaric yawp over the roofs of the world. The last scud of day holds back for me. It flings my likeness after the rest, and true as any of the shadowed wiles, it coaxes me to the vapor and the dusk. I depart as air, I shake my white locks at a runaway sun. I fuse my flesh in eddies and drift it in lacy jags. I bequeath myself to the dirt to grow from the grass I love. If you want me again, look for me under your boot soles. You will hardly know who I am or what I mean, but I shall be good health to you nevertheless and filter and fiber your blood. Failing to fetch me at first, keep encouraged. Missing me one place, search another. I stop somewhere, waiting for you. The second prompt in the readathon and in the tag is water. Roz steers us to a poem by Alice Oswald, a short story of falling, another poem which is new to me. My favorite line here is, after the speaker in the poem watches rain falling through greenery, she wishes that she might know like water how to balance the weight of hope against the light of patience. At this time when balancing hope and patience is so much with us, 
I'm especially intrigued with the idea that hope has weight, that it might be heavier than we expect. And for the speaker, and for us at this moment, what is the light of patience? Is light the delicate strength of the weightless greenery? Is it the shine that comes when the leaves get wet? Or is it light as in wisdom, the wisdom that comes from quiet slowness of patience? My selection for the water prompt is a poem called The Negro Speaks of Rivers by Harlem Renaissance author Langston Hughes. Hughes is using water here quite explicitly as a metaphor, as a way to establish the deep resonance of African Americans and other people of African descent with history and place. I've known rivers. I've known rivers ancient as the world and older than the flow of human blood and human veins. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. I bathed in the Euphrates when dawns were young. I built my hut near the Congo and it lulled me to sleep. I looked upon the Nile and raised the pyramids above it. I heard the singing of the Mississippi when Abe Lincoln went down to New Orleans and I've seen its muddy bosom turn all golden in the sunset. I have known rivers, ancient dusky rivers. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. The third prompt is animal. And for this one, Ross chose The Trout by Shea Massini. I too am a serious Heaney fan. Even when I don't particularly respond to the imagery, as is true here, I'm blown away by the way he uses language and sound and rhythm, even wordplay. In this particular poem, he early on features the word throat, a word which sounds very different from trout, but looks very similar. For my addition for this prompt, I'm going to throw out one that is not about an animal in nature so much, but a way a domestic animal and its human companion look after each other. I've loved this poem since it was published back in the late 1980s. It was written by the contemporary American poet Stephen Dobbins. Again, I think this poem has something specific to say about this time of isolation and cosmic anxiety. The poem is How to Like It. And while it's a little long, I love it enough to give all of it. These are the first days of fall. The wind at evening smells of roads still to be traveled, while the sound of leaves blowing across the lawns is like an unsettled feeling in the blood the desire to get in a car and just keep driving. A man and a dog descend their front steps. The dog says, let's go downtown and get crazy drunk. Let's tip over all the trash cans we can find. This is how dogs deal with the prospect of change. But in his sense of the season, the man is struck by the oppressiveness of his past how his memories, which were shifting and fluid, have grown more solid until it seems he can see remembered faces caught up among the dark places in the trees. The dog says, let's pick up some girls and just rip off their clothes. Let's dig holes everywhere. Above his house, the man notices wisps of clouds crossing the face of the moon. Like in a movie, he says to himself, a movie about a person leaving on a journey. He looks down the street to the hills outside of town and finds the cut where the road heads north. He thinks of driving on that road and the dusty smell of the car heater, which hasn't been used since last winter. The dog says, let's go down to the diner and sniff people's legs. Let's stuff ourselves on burgers. In the man's mind, the road is empty and dark. Pine trees press down to the edge of the shoulder where the eyes of animals fixed in his headlights shine like small cautions against the night. Sometimes a passing truck makes his whole car shake. The dog says, let's go to sleep. Let's lie down by the fire and put our tails over our noses but the man wants to drive all night 
crossing one state line after another and never stop until the sun creeps into his rearview mirror. Then he'll pull over and rest a while before starting again. And at dusk, he'll crest a hill and there, filling a valley, will be the lights of a city entirely new to him. But the dog says, let's just go back inside. Let's not do anything tonight. So they walk back up the sidewalk to the front steps. How is it possible to want so many things and still want nothing? The man wants to sleep and wants to hit his head again and again against a wall. Why is it all so difficult? But the dog says, let's go make a sandwich. Let's make the tallest sandwich anyone's ever seen. And that's what they do. And that's where the man's wife finds him, staring into the refrigerator as if into the place where the answers are kept, the ones telling why you get up in the morning and how it's possible to sleep at night, answers to what comes next and how to like it. For the fourth prompt, plants. Ross chooses the poem Daisies by Kathleen Jamie, another poem new to me. In some ways, it reminds me of that line I quoted earlier from her Alice Oswald selection. Jamie is asking us to consider that balance point between openness and closedness, between life and death. For my choice, I picked After Apple Picking, a poem by the great American poet Robert Frost. I won't read all of it here, but it has a lot in common with daisies, except, of course, the season is totally different. Frost writes at one point, but I am done with apple picking now essence of winter sleep is on the night, the scent of apples. I am drowsing off. The speaker desired the great harvest, as he says, but it leaves him overtired and unsure. I'll link below to the whole poem. All right, prompt number five, travel or destination. For this one, Roz takes us to A Day in Sussex by Wilfred Blunt. This poem reminded me of one of my favorite Emily Dickinson poems, I Taste a Liquor Never Brewed. Both poems take the reader into a transformative landscape, or perhaps in Dickinson's case, we might call it a transcendental world. I taste a liquor never brewed from tankards scooped in pearl. Not all the Frankfurt berries yield such an alcohol. Inebriate of air am I and devachet of dew reeling through endless summer days from ends of molten blue. When landlords turn the drunken bee out of the foxglove's door, when butterflies renounce their drams, I shall but drink the more, till seraphs swing their snowy hats and saints to windows run to see the little tippler leaning against the sun. The last substantive prompt is number six, to read nonfiction nature writing. I'm going to choose a poem that I think really answers to the spirit of maybe Midrash Project as well, by the contemporary American poet, Billy Collins. This one is a poem my husband David shared with me on a special day and is called Litany. You are the bread and the knife, the crystal goblet and the wine, You are the dew on the morning grass and the burning wheel of the sun. You are the white apron of the baker and the marsh bird suddenly in flight. However, you are not the wind in the orchard, the plums on the counter, or the house of cards, and you are certainly not the pine-scented air. There is just no way that you are the pine-scented air. It's possible that you are the fish under the bridge maybe even the pigeon on the general's head, but you were not even close to being the field of cornflowers at dusk. And a quick look in the mirror will show that you are neither the boots in the corner nor the boat asleep in the boathouse. It might interest you to know, speaking of the plentiful imagery of the world, that I am the sound of rain on the roof. I also happen to be the shooting star, the evening paper blowing down an alley, and the basket of chestnuts on the kitchen table. I'm also the moon in the trees and the blind woman's teacup. 
But don't worry, I'm not the bread and the knife. You are still the bread and the knife. You will always be the bread and the knife, not to mention the crystal goblet and somehow the wine. Okay, all that's left is to tag a few booktubers who might be interested in talking about nature or poetry. There's no need to recite poetry unless you're interested. Feel free to respond to Raza's beautiful selections or talk about the ones I added or just come up with your own list. Like Roz, I'd especially love to see you come up with choices that represent where you're coming from, the country or the region, perhaps, or your intellectual interests or whatever. I'll leave a list of people I'm tagging in the comments below. Thanks for this wonderful tag, Roz. I loved reading your choices and thinking about a few of my own. Thanks to all of you for letting me read so much of these out to you today. See you soon.